Fall sports at this school include sex, drugs, alcohol, seeing how many first years you can score before the playoffs. And so far, the season's got a pretty good start. The Virgin Larry's become remarkably smooth. You know, I set up the approach, I dodge the defense, anticipate the side escape, then three points, touchdown, home run, score! Don't look at me that way, because that's the way you tell the story if anybody wants to hear it. And they always do. A buddy of mine, uh, Probably my best friend, Tom. Tom the Terminator, he's called. Unstoppable on the court, team captain. Well, this one time he got into some trouble. This girl was saying that he raped her. So I said, Tom, tell me straight. He was hurt. See, and he couldn't believe that I was going to take what she said over him. Hey, if he said he didn't do it, then I believe him. He's my man. And that girl, she's sorry she ever brought it up. Well, uh... A few days ago, uh, Tom says that he's got this uh, video for the team to see after practice. You know, he's always bringing in new uh, videos, trying to get into YouTube's 5 million club, whatever. And uh, this is a, uh, okay, it's a whole movie, he calls it. So uh, it's clear a few minutes into watching it that the girl, uh, she's... The girl don't have any idea that she's on candid camera, let alone that she'd be on display for the entire basketball team's play-by-play -play review, and she also, uh, she also wasn't that willing either. She said, um, stop, like a few times. But Tom, unstoppable, Tom the Terminator, he had selective hearing that night. And this uh, was bad. And this was um, a room full of animals screaming for more, wishing that they could have had a turn, you know? Yeah, go Tom! Go Tom! Yeah, Tom! Yeah, you the man! Oh, you the man, Tom! You the man! Yeah, Tom. Yeah, you the man. <clears throat> A couple of days went by, and this uh, girl realized she missed the uh, private screening. And, uh, you know, I'd forgotten about that other girl from before. I'm wondering if maybe back then I was just believing who I wanted to believe, you know? It would be nice if the Virgin Larry were a far-off fictional character and not something that's been pulled from the headlines. My name is Kathy Plord, and that was Eric Moody performing one of the monologues for my play, You the Man. <laughs> I've been grappling with how to use theater to take over the world for quite some time now. And as you can tell, I tend to gravitate towards stuff that uses um, to keep the status quo, taboo, silence, secrecy, shame. I didn't start off in theater that way, however. Uh, when I was a youngin, I used to work in a library. I was in the children's section. And one day, a woman came up to me, and she, for some reason, asked me uh, if I would write a play for fourth graders on dental hygiene. <laughs> Call it kismet, but there you have it. The Adventures of Black Man was penned. True story. Um, it took until I was about 30, though, to actually call myself a playwright. I started writing for the stage again when I was, uh, after, through a stint with teaching, and I was writing conferences for girls' plays, and also started working on theater for healthcare reform, welfare reform, disability issues, racism, classism, things like that. Uh, at some point in there, I kind of wanted to know a little more about what I was doing, so I crafted a master's degree in theater and social change. Took a feminist perspective, looked at how theater has historically been used to affect social change and social movements, and there I was, a little more conscious and a little more informed. Had my degree in hand, and a friend of mine who had just come back from a conference, um, an eating disorders conference at Harvard, approached me with a stack of research, and she said, this is going to be your next play. Okay, well, in our small little town up the coast of Maine, eating disorders would come under the heading of rampant, if not epidemic. That would be remarkable, except for the fact that that's the way it is in this entire country. So, there I was, degree in one hand, 
research in the other, and I went to it. The very first version of The Thin Line was performed by a teenager, and in the audience was her friend and a group of adults, mostly women. Uh, feedback process, very valuable in the development of new works. The uh, feedback from the teenager was blunt and brutal. She said, so what? She said, so what? We know our friends are dealing with this. What we don't know is what to do about it. She was right. In that very first draft of The Thin Line, I had done little more than capture angst. Not so helpful. So her so what not only helped me write a better play, but her so what set the bar for all of the work I've done in theater since. She believed, as do I, that it's not enough to raise awareness. If we're going to do stuff like this, we actually need to offer options, opportunities, information. Her so what also informs the name of the production company that I formed after that play, Adverb Productions, often asked what that means, adverb, ad action. A 30-minute play is not going to provide all the action and all the answers, however. So I drew on my background as an educator and looked at other models and realized that an entire process needed to be engaged and a community before the show comes in has to do a whole bunch of stuff before it arrives. There's a lot that happens the day of the show, uh, panel, discussion, facilitation, resources, that sort of thing. The actor is an actor, love you guys, but they go away when the play is over. What I wanted was for every person in an audience to know where in their community to go for help. I wanted, this became the goal, for communities to be stronger than uh, they were before the play arrived. So what I'd like to do is introduce, well, no, let me, it's a setup actually. The setup is that when these plays go into schools, uh, there's an announcement, uh, would all the ninth graders please attend the assembly in the auditorium? We've got 200, 800 kids jostling their way into an auditorium, right? If they're lucky, it's a gym if they're not. And then um, they know it's going to suck before anything even happens. <laughs> so in order to combat that, I actually structured these plays as conversations, much like this. It's direct address. You witnessed that a moment ago. The lights are on in the house as well as on the stage. And when the actor as the character is trying to work through a problem, they really need you to listen. You are their scene partner. So at this point, I'd like to introduce one of the other characters that the actor plays in the production, You the Man. This is a father. Uh, his daughter is in an abusive and increasingly dangerous relationship, and he is unaware. He's been feeling guilty. Uh, they've not been in touch for a while. But a friend of hers has informed the dad that her boyfriend has punched a hole in the wall next to her head. The scene picks up just after the dad has gotten off the phone confronting her about this. What I wanted to say was, uh, I'm your father. And even if you are all grown up, you're not alone. If you ever need to talk to me, I will listen. I will always believe you. I will always love you. I, I will not judge you. Just let me in. But instead, what I said was, Damn it, Jenna! Why didn't you tell me? I tend to watch people in the audience while they're watching the show, and at this speech at the end, there's generally a sea of heads bobbing in recognition. I think that's part of theater's magical power for uh, transformational capacities in our ability to see ourselves, where we're strong, and where we fall down. I've been doing this work for the better part of 20 years now. Um, Adverb recently moved to the University of New England, hallelujah. And I'm approached on a regular basis by people who saw the show two years ago, four years ago, seven years ago. And what they tell me is that the play has changed or saved their life. 
I was also asked once why I didn't um, write real plays instead. <laughs> yep, well, um, perhaps when I retire, I'll have a little more time to work on things that are just entertainment. And that, that's a valid way to spend your living. Maybe uh, rude limericks, uh, that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, as others have said here today, I'm in the thick of it. There's a lot that needs to be done to address things that are not easy to fix. The healthcare professionals who attend the productions of The Thin Line and help an audience process a show, there are direct referrals those days. The domestic violence and sexual assault advocates who attend every production of The Thin Line tell us that in the hours, days, and weeks to follow, they offer direct services. There was a college student here in Maine who went second semester to her counseling office and said, you know the play we saw last semester for orientation? I'm that girl. At a national conference, there was a young woman who was in recovery of an eating disorder, and she cried the whole way through the show, generally not the goal here, but she came up to me and she said, I want you to know why I cried the whole show. I finally understand what my family has been through. A couple months ago, one of um, our actors was recognized in a shop in New York. A group of girls from a New Jersey private school were there in the city shopping, and um, the mom said, that play is when we got our daughter into treatment. Now, my life has radically changed when people have stepped in, spoken up for when I could not do so for myself, or when they've listened, or when they've just validated my reality, or when they've asked me to write a play. And because that my life was so radically altered by that invitation, it's been a real, real pleasure to be able to invite young people and the young at heart to write their own works as well. I'd like to introduce you to the Out and Allied Project. Um, this is a book that has performance built into it, and the goal of this work is to make communities, schools, families safer for queer youth. The Out and Allied Project is youth driven, youth written, youth performed, youth edited. They took it from, from nothing to an entire book. Nate Speckman will perform a piece from this, and it's one of my favorites because it epitomizes the wisdom and the resiliency of youth in general, but queer youth in particular. This is Tough Guys Wear Pink by Stephen M. Feast. If tough guys wear pink, does it matter what other guys think? Maybe it isn't whether they wear pink, but that they wear it tough. Emotions, fears, pain. A man is tough when he hides all that stuff. Walking around with that gangster swagger, looking at someone like me, in the eyes of traditional masculinity, your smirk and your words don't faze me because when it comes to your opinion, I agree. If tough guys wear pink, then I wear blue. Wearing a mask that hides who I am inside is not something I attain to, but in your segment of the population, I am the in-your-face truth. Standing here, taking your insults like bullets. I'm a queer youth. So if tough guys wear pink, does that mean that they reject the cliche that those that wear pink are usually gay? What if you're not only gay, but genderqueer, androgynous, and have gender flexibility? Maybe you hold hostility out of jealousy for my ability to express versatility in liquid gender form. I have the ability to transform norms and reform conformity, but every time I learn that there are still people out there like Sally Kern who've crossed the point of no return, it's like a cigarette burn to my pride. To be spurned and cast aside, denied my humanity under so-called Christianity, and without concern, they cast their eyes from my friends who continue to commit suicide. I see you gaze upon me, a head-to-toe scan, a smirk on your face. Somehow, you find distaste in who I am. If tough guys wear pink, do they stop and think why someone like me is such a threat to their masculinity? Tough guys are usually the gay bashers, dripping our blood on the cold concrete, when inside, their thoughts and emotions leave them incomplete. Why must I be beaten on the back streets when every walk home is a trick-or-treat? What is it that makes you a man? Is it part of God's plan for the Bible tells you so? Is that how you know? To decide who is a friend or foe. Maybe I'm your bro or just some John Doe. But why must I be discreet and defeated, retreat and deleted from this world? To be another piece of trash for the trash can simply for being who I am, a gay man. 
It just so happens that God and I have been close since birth, and he's continued to help me through hell on earth. I have been on the operating table so many times that God has had his chance but declined. So I must be on his good side. Allowed a little pride to know inside that he's my guide, and there isn't anybody who's going to tell me how to live right. Because God and I are tight. So if tough guys wear pink, they should stop and think that one day they would have been brutalized for representing something slightly feminine, risking being cast aside, for breaking the limits of traditional masculinity and being free to express themselves individually. If tough guys wear pink, then they should realize the evolution of progress and honor those who are brave enough to address the limits of sexuality and gender in the face of protest, and be impressed with the finesse that people like me possess when faced with hate for choosing to follow what happens to be innate. So I invite you to witness, recognize, and choose your verb. Getting a white horse, riding on in, rescuing the damsel in distress, breaking up the schoolyard bullies, it's really not that simple, we know that. But if your sister or your father is struggling with an eating disorder, they can get there. But to do so, they're going to need your help, your love, and support until then. If I can help my goddaughter recognize what an unhealthy and a healthy relationship is, you know, she stands a chance. This is going to be fresh, but uh, you're going to remember what happened in Dexter, Maine this past year with the Lake family. Amy Lake, mother of two, kindergarten teacher, had a protection of abuse order against her husband, estranged. After murdering them, he committed suicide. If we don't take action, we're culpable, and there are consequences. I'd like to leave you for the final moment here with Virgin Larry's complicity and consequences, uh, looking at a revoked scholarship, possible expulsion, and I thank you for your time. I did nothing to stop it. <laughs> I didn't think about leaving, so it means I'm not an innocent bystander. But it doesn't seem fair. Then I guess I gotta ask, how fair is it to be raped? You know, I keep thinking, what if I had I stood up and left? And maybe others would have followed too. And then, then just Tom would be the only one wondering what he should have done differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.